Hi there, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this morning. We are just about to get started. As you may have heard, the recording has started as well. And the recording will be on for the whole lecture. Uh, so just to remain anonymous, if you'd like to keep your cameras off, uh, I'd recommend doing so from this point on. But please feel free to be active in the chat. Um, we have a few participants here, Dr. Gare and my colleague, Derek here, that will be happy to answer any questions. And I think we will just get started with some more of the formal introductions. So let me just make sure the slides are all good and I can start advancing from here. Okay. Um, I think everything's working okay. If not, I can get some updates in the chat as well, but Without further ado, let's uh, get started. Um, just one second. Okay, great. Hi everyone, and welcome to the UBC UVic Mini Med School Lecture Series for 2023-2024. We are so pleased to have you all joining us virtually. And for those of you that have participated in the past Mini Med Schools, welcome back. We are excited to revamp the project this year with some new topics. And as you can see from our schedule here, we have about six planned for you until 2024 with a variety of topics that we hope you all find interesting. And so our topic for today is on the new Canadian alcohol use guidelines. And these were just released this past January and provided some updates on the recommended drinking levels for Canadians. And you may have heard of them because they were met with a lot of publicity, some positive and negative, but we are here to tell you guys all about it. Um, we're going to start with some background information, what the current guidelines actually are, talk about what the evidence actually means and how they talk about risk and what the mechanisms are of how alcohol um, is proposed to cause some of its effects in the human body. And then we're going to leave you with some takeaways as well from the lecture. But First, we would like to introduce you to the 2023-2024 mini med school team. My name is my name is Michael Smith, and I am a second year med student, uh, and I am at the UBC Island Medical Program here in Victoria. I'm originally from the mainland, uh, but I've been over here for about three years now, and I love Vancouver Island. And I know that a lot of you are also joining from Vancouver Island. And my colleague is. Derek Anderson, and he's also a second year med student from UBC's Vancouver Fraser program. And he's joining us today as well. Our uh, supervisor who you all uh, may be familiar with, Dr. Jane Gare um, is here as well. And together they will be present uh, in the chat box um, to help, um, help direct any questions that you guys have or concerns during the lecture. So please feel free to contact them um, in the chat box if you have any questions. And now we are conducting the, the mini med school program this year as part of our UBC school program called FLEX and which stands for flexible and enhanced learning. It's a part of our curriculum. And this is where we get to engage in scholarly and educational activities. And now you may have seen at the beginning a QR code and that is for our research purposes uh, where we are looking to assess if uh, the mini med school serves as an effective intervention for answering questions from its participants. So if you're attending these lectures, I'd highly encourage you to go to the link um, and to fill out that survey as well. We would greatly appreciate it. Now, first, before we get started, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm joining you from the unceded territory of the, of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, uh, including the Songhees, the Esquimalt and the Wasainich peoples and whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. And so I appreciate that all of you may be joining from elsewhere in our province uh, or around the island. And I just, um, I recommend that you um, consider the territories of the land in which you, you reside. Also, just a quick disclosure, uh, we are second year med students and not doctors and not yet anyways, as much as we would like to be. Um, and these talks um, will provide some sort of healthcare related information, but they do not substitute or constitute for um, medical advice. 
So please consult with a healthcare provider, either yours um, or seeing someone in the clinics if you have any personal health related concerns. And we are also not experts in this topic, but we have done our best to, to research the topic and present it to you in the best way possible. However, some of the concepts may be outside the scope of this lecture, but we will do our best to answer those questions as it is also part of the research we are conducting. And very lastly, before we get started, just to remind you of a few things I've already covered a few. You can, guys can ask questions anytime in the chat box if you'd like me to clarify something or just have a question you wanna save till the end. Um, the lecture will be recorded, um, as I mentioned earlier, and a copy of these PowerPoint slides will be sent to you all after the lecture. And a full recording of this will be available on Dr. Gare's website, so you can view it afterwards again if you'd like. There will be a 10 minute break in the middle of the lecture, so aiming for around 9.30ish. Um, of when we're gonna have that. And the content will be about one hour. And then hopefully at the end, we'll have about 15 minutes for question and answer period. So make sure you save those questions as well. And here's our outline for the morning. As mentioned, we have that 10 minute break, but we're gonna start with some background information and look at what the current guidelines are. So I don't think I see any questions before we get started, which is great, um, but please feel free if you have any to put those in there. So without further ado, uh, let's get started. So alcohol, something we are all likely familiar with. Uh, alcohol is the common name we give to beverages containing ethanol, which is a clear colorless liquid with known psychoactive and depressant properties. It is often used in connection with social events or to mark special occasions. And so what better time of the year to talk about alcohol than right before the holiday season? What you might not know though, is that alcohol is the most commonly used substance in Canada and be, it's being used by just over 75% of Canadians aged 15 and older. And that is according to the Canadian Alcohol and Drug Survey done in 2019. There is a spectrum of alcohol usage, however, and most Canadians drink moderately, but in 2021, 7.9% of drinkers aged 65 and older reported heavy drinking. And that was being defined as five or more drinks um, for men and four or more drinks for women on one occasion, at least one, at least once a month in the past year. So not all drinking is the same and we'll sort of talk about what that means when we get more into the lecture. With alcohol being so commonly used, it has had a significant impact on society. And we're, when we're thinking about these harms, there are the harms caused by alcohol to an individual person, but also to others around them and to uh, their communities. So alcohol is the leading preventable cause of death, disability, and social problems in Canada. It contributes to causing certain cancers, cardiovascular disease, liver disease, as well as unintentional injuries and violence. It was reported by Stats Canada and the CCSA in 2017 that alcohol caused 18,000 deaths in Canada. In that same year, the costs associated with alcohol use were 16.6 billion dollars, with 5.4 billion of that spent on healthcare. Worldwide, the, the WHO estimates that there are 3 million deaths that result from the harmful use of alcohol every year. And that represents 5.3% of deaths worldwide annually. So with such a significant impact on society, Canada has taken steps to assess the impact of alcohol and provide advice to address any concerns. And with an act of parliament on August 31st, 1988, they created the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction or the CCSA. And this is a really important organization because uh, they are going to be the one we're going to be talking about a lot th this lecture. So they are a non-governmental organization um, that has been tasked with, with providing national leadership to address alcohol and other drug related harms. And so some of their previous work you may be familiar with was their development of Canada's low risk drinking guidelines, which were created in 2011. And these were the ones that were replaced by the new guidelines we're going to be talking about this afternoon, sorry this morning. And so these are the ones that you may be most familiar with. Um, in, as of 2011, the CCSA had recommended that um, for women, they consume no more than 10 drinks per week with a maximum of two per day. And for men, 15 drinks a, a week with no more than three per day. And now to take a step back with all this information I've provided so far, you're probably thinking this is gonna be an anti-alcohol lecture, but that is not true. As mentioned, when the guidelines were first released, there were some strong reactions, especially by those who claimed that 
the research into the effects of alcohol doesn't consider the effects of alcohol, like the health benefits of socialization and the other community related effects. So we're gonna talk about the evidence and where the information comes from, but overall, I just want to say that the purpose of this lecture is to reflect the intentions of the guidelines, which the CCSA set out themselves, which is to allow Canadians to make an informed decision in deciding to consume alcohol and manage their own health and risks. The guidance is based on the principle of autonomy and harm reduction, and the fundamental idea here that people living in Canada have the right to know. So before we get into those guidelines, it's important to first understand what a standard drink is. And so in Canada, a standard drink is 17.05 milliliters of pure alcohol, which is the equivalent of about 12 ounces of beer or cider, five ounces of wine, and a shot or about one and a half ounces of spirits or hard alcohol. Now, this is very important to understand early on because the CCSA guidelines um, are based on the consumption of standard drinks. So although you might only have one drink, uh, you might be consuming more than you think if it's not what the CCSA says is a standard drink and add it up over an evening or a week, uh, those can add up. So to assess your knowledge and to check that you're all still with me this morning, uh, we have a couple of quiz questions to try things out. So I'd all, I'd like to ask you all this first question here. I'm just gonna pull it up here as a poll so you guys can answer on Zoom. Uh, hopefully you can see that there now. And I'd like you to answer how many standard drinks are in a bottle of wine. Um, and so wine, a whole bottle being 750 milliliters. Um, and so is it approximately three standard drinks, five, seven, or nine? And I'll give you about 15 more seconds to answer that. Great, I'm seeing some good responses. Oh, we're at about seven, great. Okay, I think we'll end it there. Uh, thank you guys all for answering. And I can share the results with you here. So here's what you guys said. About five out of seven of you said there's probably five standards drinks and a few guessed seven and nine. So um, I can sort of move on in the lecture. Um, making sure I can advance with this. There we go. So yeah, here's the answer. So there are about 5.3 standard drinks in a 750 milliliter uh, um, bottle of wine. And so if you're in the habit of splitting a bottle of wine with someone over a meal, this could be a good um, number to know how many standard drinks are in there. And so we're gonna go through one more question. Um, I want you guys to all guess which contains more alcohol, nine ounces of wine, 20 ounces of beer, or three ounces of spirits. And so let me just pull that up. Great, and you should see it there in front of you now. I'll give you about 30 seconds to do that. Great, I'm seeing some good participation here. So I can just end the poll there and share with you guys the results. So the majority of you said three ounces of spirits, but we also had some people saying it could be the wine, the beer, or they might be the same. So, in fact, it is the spirits, um, as you can see, just being about 2.08 standard drinks. However, the other two options were pretty close at being um, a bit more, almost twice what a standard drink is. Um, and so if you answered that they're, they're about the same, I would sort of take that as well, so. So we're gonna move on from that, but the takeaway from that exercise is that it can be hard to calculate standard drinks. And especially when you're drinking socially at an event or a restaurant, when someone's pouring your drink and you're not sure how much, the percentages of alcohol can be different. If it's like a hard beer or a more concentrated bottle of wine, that might add up to be a bit more of a standard drink. However, the big picture here is that it's important to understand that not all drinks are 
standard drinks. So when you're looking at the guidelines and you might be counting your drinks based on that, it's important to just keep that in mind. And if you're curious for more information that can help you track your intake, UVEC in collaboration with the Canadian Institute for Substance Use Research, the CISUR, um, they've created a great resource for allowing you to calculate standard drink equivalents. And so the link to this website will be included in the resource form at the end of the lecture. Okay, so we've done some good background information and now we're gonna get into the current guidelines themselves. So as mentioned in January, 2023, the CCSA released a document called Canada's Guidance on Alcohol and Health. It outlines seven key takeaways on various factors around the consumption of alcohol, but the largest changes to their recommendations since 2011 is regarding the risks, um, sorry, is around the risks regarding consumption levels. So from this report, they show that there is a continuum of risk when it comes to alcohol consumption. Now, the risk is, uh, is low for people who consume two standard drinks or less per week, and all these, uh, all these standard drink levels are per week. Now, the risk is moderate for those who consume between three to six standard drinks per week, and it is high for those who consume more than six standard drinks per week with increasingly higher levels of risk with each additional drink. And again, as we talked about earlier, these are all standard drinks. And so the CCSA goes into a bit more detail here when they release their guidelines. And this is from a poster that they put out. Uh, the CCSA claims that if you don't drink, that not drinking has benefits such as better health and better sleep. With one to two standard drinks per week, you will likely avoid alcohol-related consequences to yourself and others. With three to six uh, standard drinks per week, your risk of developing several different, de several different types of cancer, including breast and colon cancer increases. And with seven or more standard drinks per week, your risk of heart disease and stroke increases. This is another statement from the CCSA, which is their primary advice for all Canadians. Now, this is important because there had been some previous advice circulating that low amounts of drinking were considered harmless or even beneficial in some cases of things like ischemic heart disease. And so we'll talk a bit of more a bit more about that later. Uh, and as we've seen for certain drinking levels, that risk is low, as we will see. But the CCSA wanted to make it very clear that every drink does have some risk. So there is no such thing as harmless drinking. That risk is very low in some cases, um, but this is the information they wanted to communicate. Another important point to mention on this slide is that they do provide advice on per day consumption. It's quite small in the poster here, but I highlighted it here just so you guys could see it, is that the CCSA recommends that you don't exceed two drinks on any given day. This is primarily to reduce overall drinking, uh, but also to lessen the risk of alcohol related injuries and violence that can occur with higher levels of drinking. And we'll talk more about that later in the lecture of what that means. Okay, so you guys have seen the guidelines and the lecture could probably end there if you guys just wanted to know what the information was, uh, but you guys probably have lots of questions about what it all actually means, where the information comes from and how it all works. So in the next section, we're gonna dive into answering all these questions, talking about risk, the evidence, and then the mechanisms of harm. So first we're gonna talk about risk and what a risk threshold is. So this is the level of risk that is deemed acceptable. And in science research on substance use, th these are established thresholds of risk that people are, are willing to accept. And these are based on guidelines and in medical journals um, that are established and standardized for most substances. But for alcohol, they are often set at a one in 1000 or a one in 100 risk of premature death. And premature death is defined as a death before the age of 75 years. So the question is, however, is not that alcohol causes a one in 1000 risk of death, but it's what amount of use and how many standard drinks um, that you would intake that gets you to that risk level. And so the CCSA used the research to inform these risks and to figure out how much alcohol usage correlates to these levels of risk. And so we've kind of already seen that a bit, 
Um, but through the research that the CCSA conducted, they revealed that in Canada, the limit associated with a one in 1,000 chance of premature death um, related to an alcohol condition is two standard drinks per week, um, while the one in 100 risk is six standard drinks per week. Um, and so as you can see here, this sort of one in 1,000 risk of premature death correlates to about that level, and then the one in 100 risk of premature death correlates to about that level. And so there's a bit more math that comes into it and how they figured all this out. And just another way of interpreting what the, the values mean, um, as you can see here, um, a one in 1000 risk of premature death correlates to a 0.1% chance and then one in 100 is 1%. But also another way of uh, looking into it is using a lifetime absolute risk approach. And so that correlates that the, the risk values that you see here um, are related to a 17.5 years of life lost attributable, attributable to alcohol per 1000 lifetimes or 100 lifetimes. So on average, you get about 17.5 years of life lost um, in the, so let's take the low risk category, for example. Um, if you drink two standard drinks per week, there's 17.5 years of life lost per 1000 lifetimes. Now, what exactly does that all mean? Um, because it might seem a bit complicated as well. Um, now, I'm no statistician, um, and some of this is very complex. Um, and so if you're anything like me, you sort of look to the experts uh, to see how they describe it. And from this, I was able to find a great summary from um, the UVEC CISUR that I mentioned earlier. And they actually work directly with the CCSA in informing the public and conducting research related to substance use. So this is a great resource to get the information from. Oh, sorry. Sorry, just skipped ahead there. Um, so they said that a good way to interpret the findings is that with a low risk threshold, you have a one in 1000 chance of dying early from alcohol consumption at that level. And that death on average will occur 17.5 years earlier than the age that you would have died at. So this, this level, the 17.5 years of life loss does not mean that everyone who drinks loses 6.4 days of life, but it's that you have a one in thousand chance of dying early. And of all the deaths that occur due to alcohol use at that level, that will occur 17.5 years earlier. And so a big picture is that, and for others, not so much. And so it's just important that we all assess our own comfort levels with risk and make the best informed decisions we can around these choices. And so I'd like you all to answer this first question here, which will hopefully um, I can pull up for you on Zoom, but I'd like you to all just answer, and there's no correct answer here. How are you all feeling now learning about Canada's guidance on alcohol and health? And let me just get that poll activated for you guys. So I'm seeing some responses come in. That's great. Give it about 20 more seconds there. I'm also just going to check in the chat to see if we've had any questions so far. Yeah, that's all good. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll there. Oh, I got one more answer in right at the end there, which is great. So hopefully you can all see that, is that uh, for the majority of you, this information is new, which is great. And uh, you know we're quite happy to be sharing this information with you guys um, and hopefully provide some more explanations on it all. Um, and if the guidelines seem all clear to you, that's great. Um, and hopefully you will uh, find something 
um, you will find you get something out of this next part of the lecture where we kind of talk about um, some of the mechanisms of alcohol and how it's um, proposed to cause its effects, um, as well as where the CCSA gets their evidence from. So I'll just stop sharing that. Great. Um, so we actually have time for a break now, which is kind of right on time with it being sort of 25 minutes after the hour. Um, we will take a break here for 10 minutes um, and we'll be back at sort of 935 sharp. Just want to be respectful of all your guys' time. Then we'll take the last sort of 25 minutes until the top of the hour to go through the mechanisms um, and a few other things and also answer some more questions. Um, so yeah, I will allow you all to take sort of a 10 minute break here. Um, if you'd like to, you can put more questions in the chat that we can answer when we get back. Um, or if you'd like to, uh, I highly encourage you to fill out our pre-lecture survey, uh, not just for this lecture, but for the other lectures we're doing uh, for the mini med school series, as it will really help with our research going forward. So, all right, I will give you your 10 minutes starting now. Uh, see you guys at, you know what, we'll call it 936 now, because I've taken an extra minute. Okay, see you guys all then.
Okay, uh, I think everyone, yep, you guys can hear me and all is good. Well, welcome back. Hope you guys all had a good break. Um, we're going to move on to the last part of the lecture um, and leave some time for questions at the end. Um, and to get you guys straight back into it, uh, we're going to start off with a quick poll. Um, I will activate it here soon, but uh, just a bit of a review from the first part of the lecture. Um, if you can remember what the high risk or the one in 100 risk of premature death from alcohol intake, what that threshold is and what amount of alcohol use gets you to that um, risk threshold. Great, I'm seeing some responses coming in here. So you guys are back with me, which is great. And again, thank you all very much for joining this morning. Leave like another five seconds, five. Okay, great, I'll just stop it there and you guys can see your results. So the majority of you said about six standard drinks per week. And as we can see here, if I go to the slide, that is correct. And so that is what we've sort of talked about in the first part of the lecture, talking about the, the low risk drinking um, versus the high risk threshold drinking, um, correlating to a one in 100 risk of premature death before the age of 75, um, that amount being six standard drinks per week. Okay, so with the remaining time, we're going to look at the evidence uh, the CCSA has for making these claims um, and what some of the mechanisms are behind how alcohol can cause these adverse health effects and premature death. So to inform the research and guidelines, the CCSA conducted a review of all the available literature dated from 2017 to 2021. And they identified about 6,000 systematic reviews related to alcohol use and its consequences. They had some specific inclusion criteria for the questions they were trying to answer. And I can go more into that at the end of the lecture if you'd like. However, to answer their questions on guidance, um, sorry, to answer their questions uh, to guide public knowledge, they filter down the number of studies from about 6,000 to only about 14 for their long-term risk guidelines. Now, 14 doesn't seem like a lot. Uh, however, it's important to remember that these are systematic reviews, uh, which they themselves are already made up um, of a lot of studies uh, that assess directly the impact of alcohol on health. And so adding up all the studies included in these 14 systematic reviews, individually, they get to about 364 um, studies. One second here, great. So it's important to mention, however, that the types of studies, um, sorry, it's important to mention the types of studies that we are mentioning when we talk about the 364 that we looked at, because there are a lot of different types of, of research studies. So it's generally considered that randomized controlled trials are the gold standard when you want to identify the effect of an intervention, like does alcohol cause cancer? So you can control for it and any of the other variables that would influence it. Now that is the ideal. However, for examining the association between alcohol consumption and health, this study design would neither be practical or ethical. So for example, it would be very unethical to randomize one group of females uh, to drink alcohol on a daily basis for 10 years, and then another group of females to abstain and then see who develops breast cancer. That would be sort of very impractical and unethical to do, especially because we know that alcohol is a carcinogen as well due to the associated observed effects. So in the field of alcoholology, most evidence is derived from these types of studies here called cohort or observational studies. So they take a group of individuals um, that self-identify as consuming a certain amount of alcohol and they just follow them through time and they look at the long-term effects of them and then they take 
another cohort of people who do have similar characteristics, who don't consume as much alcohol or a bit less, um, and they follow them through time. And then they look at the outcomes based on that. And so since a cohort study is not sort of the ideal compared to the randomized control trial, uh, this does not mean that the quality of evidence is any lower. And in fact, it's just a different way to look at it. And in a lot of ways, it's a more accurate reflection of real life uh, by observing the rates of cancer or premature death between those who drink and those who don't. And so here are the results. And this is sort of the graph that the CCSA took all that information from and plotted it on a big chart. And this is where they get their information from. So as you can see here on the Y axis, we have the, um, the years of life lost. And as you can see, it's increasing which, with average alcohol intake in drinks per week. And so I'm gonna to try to zoom in here as well. Now you might not be able to see my cursor, but I wanna describe it to you. So where the solid red and orange lines, where they cross over this black solid line, that correlates over here to about a 7.5 years of life loss per 1,000 people. And so as we talked about earlier, that correlates to a one in 1,000 risk of premature death. And so if we come back over here, that level, as you can kind of see where it crosses over that line, that is attributable to two drinks per week. And now the one in 100 line at this dotted line right here, it's kind of obscured, but you can see it crosses over there and that correlates to about six drinks per week uh, for the one in 100 risk level, as you can see there. And so I can provide this to you guys at the end. I have a link to it as well, if you would like to take a, a closer look at this information again. Now, this scary looking table is a bit more of the information the CCSA provides about the increased absolute risk of diseases and injury based on um, uh, an average weekly alcohol use. This can all be accessed on the CCSA website if you are very curious about the individual risks of certain conditions that they identify here, a lot of them being cancer, some related to heart conditions and some strokes as well. However, the general trend that you can see for this is that with increasing alcohol intake per week, your risk of your absolute risk of developing these conditions increases. So this is the chart for men. And this here is the chart for women. Now, as you can see, because they reviewed all the literature, they did find some associated protective effects uh, with pancreatitis and diabetes for people that drank. However, when they take all these together and you add them all up, overall, the risk of premature death is still higher at these levels. So while you might be less likely to get diabetes, you're going to be more likely to um, encounter all these other effects that could cause premature death. So back to sort of the relevant results to sum that up, uh, this is the most important information the CCSA wants you to know. Um, is that you have a one in 1,000 risk of premature death with stu two standard drinks per week and one in 100 with six. However, it's very important to identify that this research is based on population data and not individual data. And you and me and all of us, we all have unique socio-behavioral, genetic, and medical circumstances, um, as well as other extrinsic factors um, that are protective and risk factors that can all put us at a higher or lower risk, such as like what we eat, where we live, our exercise levels, our family histories, everything. We are all very different. Um, so the CCSA um, is providing this advice to all Canadians, but not specific Canadians. And overall, the CCSA encourages um, you all to reduce your alcohol intake, but if you aren't sure if your individual use is too high for you or you're concerned about it, then they say to ask your doctor for their opinion as they're able to sort of consider your individual risk level and all those, uh, the relevant risk factors. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna talk about with the remaining time is a brief overview of the pathophysiology or sort of how um, alcohol can cause disease um, of the, these variety of, um, sort of premature death related consequences that the CCSA has identified. And so from that long list that we saw that huge grid, I've chosen about three to go through and just sort of a 
disclaimer before we get into it. All of these warrant their own lectures and they will be very complex, but I'm gonna try to give you the um, best briefest explanation I can of these as well. So you will recall at the beginning of the lecture, I mentioned the CCSA recommends against consuming more than two standard drinks per any occasion. Now, the reason they did this is because they performed a rapid review in looking at the association between alcohol use and the risk of perpetuating alcohol-related violence. And so they found that while no exact dose response relationship could be established, they did find that alcohol is frequently associated with violent and aggressive behavior, including intimate partner violence, male to female sexual violence, and aggression and violence between adults. Now, the theory of this is that alcohol is related to intoxication, um, of that, that feeling that sort of changes the psychoactive effects in your brain. Now, we all know that when the majority of us drink alcohol, alcohol we don't all become more violent um, and perpetuate the violence. But it's important to recognize that some people do, and the reasons can be very complex and have a lot of um, factors associated with them, um, but alcohol is identified to play a role in that, so it's important to understand how that works. So this is sort of going to be more of a scientific discussion about how that's proposed to work. Um, I'm just going to kind of walk you through it. So first, within our brains, um, we have these cells called neurons up here, and they're the cells that make up your brain. And they communicate with each other via chemical messengers called neurotransmitters. Um, and these are sort of two examples here. So excitatory neurons uh, that, propagate, um, uh, that propagate signals within the brain um, use glutamate, while inhibitory neurons use GABA. Now, inhibitory doesn't mean bad. It simply means that some signals are turned off in appropriate ways. And it's very similar to how a computer works using a chains of ones and zeros. So one or excitatory can means on and zero or inhibitory means off. Um, and so these neurotransmitters work by attaching to receptors on neurons and they sort of perform a chain that links along and they perform their function. So, Alcohol works on many systems in the brain, but its primary um, role is that it functions to increase GABA um, in increasing the transmission of GABA and decreasing the action of glutamate. Um, and so this makes sense when we think about intoxication, since we are enhancing the inhibitions within our brain. Um, that means we can perceive less and shut out more. Um, and some people may black out. Um, but we also might say or do more because, you know, we have thoughts in our brain that we often inhibit um, in an area called our prefrontal cortex that allows for executive functioning. If we can't sort of turn off those signals in our head, we might just say or do anything. Um, and so it sort of enhances the inhibition within our brain. Um, that also makes sense when we think about uh, your balance and like being clumsy, it can affect the cerebellum, which is located in the back of your head. Um, and with the reduced inhibitions, we sort of lose our coordination and we can become off balance like that. And that can lead to um, impaired coordination as well, um, which is a primary factor in um, intoxicated driving um, and drinking and driving as well. So very complex. Um, I'm happy to explain it more at the end of the lecture if you guys have questions, but this is just a general overview of alcohol's effects in the brain. Now, going on to the next section, I want you all to answer this question, is that which of the following cancers are associated with an increased risk of alcohol consumption? Uh, let me just get the poll activated for you. And there we go. So you should see it there. And you are able to choose more than one response, so don't be shy there. Okay, that's great, I'll leave another 10 seconds. Good, we're seeing some more answers coming in. Okay, I will end it there. Show you guys the results. So 
more people were kind of thinking liver cancer and colon cancer, but there was a majority of people that did consider a lot of them to be associated with um, increased alcohol consumption. And when we look at the answer, we find that that is true, is that uh, as we will sort of see and come to understand uh, all of these uh, types of cancers, particularly breast and colon are associated with increased alcohol consumption. And so in talking about cancer, it's important to recognize that cancer is the leading cause of death in Canada. Um, it is a known carcinogen identified by the WHO. And uh, in 2020, they found that there were about 7,000 alcohol attributable cancer deaths in Canada. And in that establishment as a known carcinogen, um, they have been able to identify at least seven types of cancer um, that um, are related to increased alcohol consumption, like liver, esophageal, oral, and rectal cancer, but primarily breast and colon cancer, which as you can see here on that graph, make up the majority of cancer-related deaths. So when we're talking about how alcohol can cause cancer, it's first important to understand how alcohol is metabolized in the body. So you might be familiar with the fact that alcohol impacts your liver. And so that is the location of its metabolism where ethanol here is converted into a toxic metabolite called acetaldehyde. Now this can be broken down into acetate, which we can excrete in our urine. Um, however, with increased or prolonged alcohol consumption, this can overwhelm the liver and cause a buildup of acetaldehyde, which can cause a lot of negative effects. So one of the primary mechanisms here for the carcinogenesis or the cancer causing effects of alcohol is that acetaldehyde can cause irreversible DNA damage. And you can see that below here too, where alcohol is um, implicated in impairing DNA repair and remodeling, also called methylation, but can also form these structures called DNA adducts, which have been shown to directly damage DNA. And so there are also some other proposed me mechanisms for the carcinogenesis of alcohol. Another of which, which is really important for breast cancer is that it is associated with an increasing um, concentration of estrogen. And estrogen, as you guys might be familiar with, is implicated in breast um, carcinogenesis or cancer causing. And I apologize here, uh, O-estrogen is the same as estrogen. Um, I obtained these graphics from a helpful Australian government website. I've also linked that at the end if you guys are curious on learning more. Now I will stop there by saying that um, there are many other mechanisms of alcohol's carcinogenesis. Uh, you may be familiar with um, how alcohol impacts folate or vitamin B9 um, and that is related to um, sort of the, um, the adverse effects that alcohol can have on pregnancy because folate um, allows DNA to form. If you impair that, you can interrupt um, the growth and development of the fetus during pregnancy. It can also um, reduce the immune system's effect to sort of surveil the body and to identify cancer. But the big picture here, it's important to understand that um, alcohol can cause more cancer causing effects other than just the, the liver, such as in the colon or in the breasts. So lastly, after cancer, heart disease is the second leading cause of death in Canada. And for very many years, there has been a commonly held belief that drinking in moderation offered protection against coronary artery disease or ischemic heart disease. And this has been very widely publicized. Now, the most recent research from the CCSA has shown, however, that is a bit more nuanced than that. While they do identify that there is no sort of harmful effect of alcohol on ischemic heart disease, there is also no protective effect of alcohol on ischemic heart disease. So that risk was null and they weren't able to identify anything. However, alcohol is a well-known risk factor for the development of hypertension or high blood pressure, hemorrhagic stroke, um, alcohol-related heart failure, and some arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation or AFib. And it's interesting because high blood pressure itself is a, a known risk factor for coronary artery disease or ischemic heart 
disease. So the main message here that um, organizations like the World Heart Federation want you to know is that alcohol consumption is not good for your heart. It's not good for your health. And so when it comes to how alcohol causes this cardiac related damage, they are very complex. Um, but the first thing to identify here is that it can occur at the cellular level where alcohol can induce things such as mm, mm, mitochondrial dysfunction um, and the mitochondria in your cells, they you may know them as the powerhouse of the cell, they produce energy. Um, they can cause dysfunction in them and produce things like inflammatory markers and oxidative stress. Um, and that can lead to cell death. Um, and if that occurs in the linings of your arteries, um, it can disrupt their ability to respond to your body's own way of controlling blood pressure. So they become a bit more stiff um, and then your body isn't able to control that and you can get high blood pressure. Additionally, it's been identified that with long-term heavy alcohol use, alcohol can impair the contractility of your cardiac cells um, and in a condition called car uh, alcoholic cardiomyopathy. Um, and this is a form of heart failure um, that you guys um, may not be familiar with because um, heart failure can come in a, a lot of different forms. But what happens here is that the walls of your heart can actually thin and stretch, which means your heart gets a bit weaker and it can't pump as effectively as it should. Um, and that can lead to um, death as well in that condition. So these effects are hypothesized to come both directly from ethanol as well as acetaldehyde that we looked at as one of the toxic metabolites of alcohol. So the summary from all those mechanisms is that they're very complicated. Um, and uh, probably if you guys are hearing them for the first time, uh, it can be a lot to absorb, but the big picture here and the important thing to understand is that um, when it comes to these consequences, like increased risks of cancer and sort of cardiac related incidents, we are seeing these associations at the population level. So we sort of know they are related or correlated in some way. And then we also have an idea for how they work. And that's important for informing treatments and chronic disease management and how can we can really um, help to mitigate those effects, um, like the treatments we can do, but also recommending the reduction of alcohol intake. And as always, I think it's always important to mention when giving sort of a healthcare related um, uh, talk is that scientific research is always changing. So your body, it's doing its thing. It's always doing its thing and it hasn't really changed, but the research might change around that. So what is okay now might not be okay later. Um, and we've kind of seen that even with the 2011 uh, drinking guidelines recommending one thing and now that risk level being changed uh, but this is important because, um, you know, we as future healthcare professionals are working hard and we want to give you guys the most up-to-date information about your health. Um, and so it's in our best interest to keep you guys healthy and to have the best information that you can. Okay, great. So we're at the top of the hour. I'm just going to go through a few last takeaways from the lecture before we get into questions. Um, and so hopefully, uh, you guys are, all still doing good. And if you have any questions, as mentioned, feel free to put them in the chat and we can answer them at the end as well. So just to recap, and probably the most important um, image you'll see from this lecture is that the, the guidance from the CCSA says there is a continuum of risk associated with alcohol intake. And that risk for people who consume two standard drinks or less per week is negligible to low. It's a moderate risk for those who consume between three to six standard drinks per week. And you're at an increasingly higher risk if you consume more than, uh, if you consume seven or more standard drinks per week. And the advice from the CCSA is that drinking less is better. All alcohol has some risk associated to it, some more than others. Um, but the advice is that alcohol isn't good for you. Um, but that's not to say that you shouldn't drink it at all. It's considered an indulgence and we should treat it as such as well when we're looking at the long-term effects of alcohol. And a big picture point here as well is that there are no associated protective effects of alcohol when it comes to morbidity and mortality or death. Um, and so that's something the CCSA really wants to communicate. 
But as a final reminder, this is not an this is not an anti-alcohol lecture. And so we are merely reflecting the purpose set out by the CCSA, which is that people have a right to know about the risks associated with alcohol, is that there's a continuum of risk, which can allow people to situate themselves where they are on that continuum. And so increasing alcohol literacy and health literacy, so you guys are more aware of that. It's important to understand as well is that we all take risks every day doing very many things like driving your car or um, the food you eat or any other sort of activities you do in your life. And that's just a natural part of life. Um, so hopefully from this lecture, um, you've been able to sort of identify what the risk is associated with alcohol intake and then how much risk you are comfortable with as well. And if you are interested in checking in or uh, reducing your drinking levels, the CCSA provides some advice and tips on how to do that. Um, I've included these here for your reference after the lecture. Um, and uh, it's also available on their website if you're interested in learning more about that. And as always, you can talk to your doctor about your individual risk and any advice that they might have as well. Okay, these are my references. Uh, these are here for your reference when you get these slides. I've also included here some more helpful resources that you can refer back to. First one here is that drink counter I mentioned at the start um, from the UVEC and the CISUR, if you're interested in counting your drinks a bit more accurately. The CCSA website has their full report available on their website that you can check out. This lecture recording will be available on Dr. Gare's website. Um, and you can also check out the UVIC CISUR directly. They um, perform a lot of research um, advice when it comes to uh, public education related to alcohol and substance use. Um, and so you can check them out um, for some more information on other things that they're doing, both related to alcohol and not. Uh, I'm just gonna go through the last a uh, couple slides. I don't only have about two more. So thank you all for attending. Uh, that was the first in our lecture series and we have five more. And so next week, next Saturday morning, Derek, my colleague in the chat, um, will be giving a lecture on accessing a family doctor in BC um, and probably providing a lot more information on what primary care looks like in our province now as well. And then in the springtime, we have some more lectures as well that hopefully you will tune into as well. And so, yeah, thank you all for your time and your attention. We have some time for questions that we're gonna get to. Um, and yeah, we can sort of start to look at those now. Uh, so I think I saw one in the chat, which is great. And yeah, feel free to type it in the chat, but also feel free to unmute yourself as well. If you'd like to say them out loud, um, we are totally fine with that. But uh, first question here, does uh, moderate or high alcohol use at a prior time in your life leave you at risk of alcohol related disease for the remainder of your life? That is a really good question. So uh, I don't think that was directly covered by the CCSA when they talk about their guidelines. Um, but uh, when they do look at sort of the alcohol related effects, they are primarily ongoing. So someone that has sort of a consistent amount of use at their, um, at their current state and what they're associated with uh, developing. Um, they don't really talk about sort of how much alcohol at a prior time in their life, um, how, what that sort of puts you at an effect for. However, there are some... Um, systems and processes within the body that are less able to adapt to changes than others. And those, um, uh, those systems within your body can sort of develop these things called like scarring and fibrosis, um, which can be chronic and can sort of put you at a higher risk um, for alcohol related consequences um, for the remainder of your life. Um, however, the biggest advice from the CCSA is that um, reducing your alcohol, alcohol intake now and for the longest period of time is going to see the greatest effect there. Um, so I hope I've answered your question. I would say that um, there is some risk 
related to previous sort of high alcohol use at a prior time in your life, but it is not the same as ongoing chronic use. Um, and that's what the um, CCSA is really trying to get at when they talk about, you know, six drinks a week and then for a whole year and then spanned over many, many years as well. So yeah, so thank you for answering. So thank you for asking that question. Um, I'm happy to take any more questions if you guys have them, if you wanna put them in the chat um, or unmute yourselves as well, I'm happy to do that. I can wait a few minutes if you guys are just sort of collecting your thoughts as well. Okay, well, oh, I think I got not a question, but thank you, I learned a lot. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, feedback as well. Um, and yeah, not just questions, but feedback is welcome as well. Um, and uh, that actually lends into uh, the sort of final thing I wanted to say before I let you all go. I won't uh, leave you here in silence as well, but um, I, uh, would encourage you guys um, to uh, share the link um, that you used to sign up for this lecture when you first registered on the Google form and you can share it out to anyone you'd like in your social circles, um, friends and family, really anyone is able to attend these um, and you were able to attend any of the upcoming talks that we have here. Um, I'd also encourage them to fill out the pre-lecture survey because that can be done before sort of any of these, if you guys have any questions or anything that you want to be addressed during these lectures. Um, so yeah, I can, um, I guess, try to find that link again, if you guys don't quite have it with you, it should be in the email. Um, let me just see if I can locate that again. So yeah, here is the link in the chat for the Google form you used to sign up. Please feel free to share that uh, with anyone that you'd like. Uh, we've done this talk a lot in the past with many other groups and a lot of other people. And so hopefully we can sort of build up for the new year, um, get a bit more attendance and participation. But for those of you that um, attended, I really hope you got a lot out of it. Um, and the second link I'm going to share in the chat as well, which you will be getting an email about it, is um, a uh, post-lecture survey, um, which can kind of assess your satisfaction um, with the lecture here, and it helps inform our research as well. So I will just send that in the chat. So um, yeah, the post-lecture survey is there, which should be active and you guys can access that anytime you would like. It doesn't have to be right now. Um, you guys can uh, spend the, the rest of the day or anytime this weekend to fill that out. Um, and we would really appreciate it, uh, your feedback on this. So uh, yeah, uh, if that is it for questions and comments and everything, I think I will let you guys go to enjoy your weekend. Um, thank you very much for attending as well. And we will see you next week.